So my name is Jennifer Walski, and um, I actually help run some of our undergraduate programs. I see a few of you here. Brandon, Sherry, you want to raise your hands? I'm going to embarrass you. They're in the back. Anyways, I know we have a mixed audience tonight, uh, many MBAs, many members of the community. We're so thrilled to have you here. We're also thrilled to have an 07 and 08 MBA grads here to talk to you guys about how to write a business fundable business plan, giving you both the VC perspective and the entrepreneur's perspective. Um, additionally, it's interesting that Rebecca helped run the business plan competition uh, the year that you won it. Yeah. Uh, so there's many, many connections here, and it just I goes. Know the secret to winning. Yeah, you gotta have an insider. So it just goes to show if you get involved in the business plan competition, strange things can happen down the road. You know, many maybe the VC funding you at some point um, that you're participating in. So welcome. I'm now going to turn it over. Rebecca, I believe you're starting. Yeah, are we on? We're on. Yeah, I think it speaks to you. Never know what your classmates are going to do when they get out, so be careful, right? <laughs> um, so welcome tonight. Thank you all for coming. And we're here to talk with you about how to write a venture, uh, business plan that venture capitalists will actually fund. So maybe not how to win the competition, per se. Actually, hopefully those two things are aligned. But how to write a plan VCs will fund. And as she said, I'm Rebecca Lynn partner at Morgan Thaler Ventures. I'm a Bolt and a Haas graduate, so I did the JD MBA program when I was here. And I did a lot in the entrepreneurship realm and in Leicester Center when I was here and ran the business plan competition, which was a lot of fun. So happy to be back. And Brett is here with me from Tube Mogul. I'm a 2007 MBA. Uh, I was an absolute Leicester Center groupie when I was here. So I think I was in the business plan competition twice the first year Got to the semifinals, uh, second year, we tied for first place. We like to just say we won it. Although we did get the check that was reserved for the second place team, and they had a little piece of paper on it uh, that says first. And no one believes we won first place, but, but we did. Um, you did. While I was here, we started the company, which I'll tell you more about, in the incubator. Uh, we practiced our pitch in the, uh, the pitch lab, which the, the Leicester Center runs. Um, you know, so this was, uh, I think their new slogan is the Leicester Center is, is the ultimate launch pad, and it really was for us. Um, my co-founders I met in a class, uh, both the, the person I founded the company with and then our first employee, uh, our early engineers uh, were from Haas. We won 30 grand, which was a, a gift from the gods at, at the time, um, and unbeknownst to us, the venture capitalist that did our A round two years after the business plan competition or a year and a half. He was actually in the audience at the time watching us. So all these good things happened. Um, one of Rebecca's partners at Morgan Thaler was a judge during the semifinal competition. Uh, we pitched him. He didn't fund us, but he introduced us to one of the people that's been our board member for, for three years. So. Uh, I am a real live example of someone that got a lot out of out of the school and the competition in particular. Absolutely, I think I think the competition and and your opportunities here are exactly what you make of them. So, take advantage of them while you're here. It's a, it's a very I think special time and place. So, in terms of our venture fund, we've been around for 40 years. We were one of the first venture firms in the valley. We have a $400 million fund we're currently investing out of, about $3 billion of assets under management. We are an early stage IT and life sciences firm, which means we do seed stage, series A, a little series B here and there, but mostly seed and series A. We've had a couple of very exciting recent exits. One is Medtronic, which, or not Medtronic, sorry, Ardian, which exited to Medtronic last week at $800 million. I don't know if you all saw that or not, but it's a med device company. And the other was Siri, which exited just a few months ago to Apple, which is a voice-assisted um, voice personal assistant is what, what Siri does, and there was a lot of news about that. And very exciting company news recently. So Evernote, how many of you here are familiar with Evernote? Fabulous. So Evernote just crossed 5 million users last week, which is a really exciting milestone in the company's history. And Practice Fusion, the largest cloud-based electronic medical record, just crossed 5 million patients, which is another really exciting milestone. And they did it almost on the same day. It, it's impressive. It, it wasn't that long ago when Rebecca to me, it was just Rebecca, um, 
we always thought she was a little crazy because when she was here, she was also doing the, uh, the law school program at the same time, and she had kids. And it, had a three-month-old. It, you know, three probably months. half our class wanted to work for, for a venture capitalist when they graduated, and, and it's really hard because there's just not that many jobs, and, and they want people that are really experienced. And not only did Rebecca get the job, but within, what, two years? Something like that. She was promoted yeah. to partner which is just unheard of. And I remember the email kind of going around and I think it went to all of my class. I was in the year ahead of her and her class. Um, so we're really lucky to have alums like her that are back investing. So I wanted to give you a hand. Right. And, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, be nice to her because she writes big checks now. Um, <laughs> So Toot Mogul is a video advertising platform for brands. And in short, what that means is we help TV advertisers that are spending a lot of money on TV ads get those same ads watched online, uh, in mobile devices, in Facebook games, ultimately on TV as well. Uh, and I can talk to you more about it um, later on. Uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, were co my co-founder was in my class our first employee was in my class. Um, our director of marketing was in the class underneath me. So we're definitely a, a Berkeley company. We won the competition. We've raised about $17 million. Our A round was with uh, Trinity Ventures. Their big hit was Starbucks. Uh, we're gonna be their next big hit. Uh, and our B round was with Foundation Capital. Um, and it's working. We've run hundreds of campaigns this year from big brand advertisers that you know. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Clorox, Microsoft, most of our business comes through ad agencies. So uh, we're kind of scaling right now. Uh, revenue is um, going up and, and we're hiring. So both engineers, interns, marketing people, and we like to hire from Cal. So uh, I'll be up afterwards if you're interested in talking to me about that. <laughs> Absolutely. If you guys, I mean, Tube Mogul is a company that we uh, we follow closely. And as venture capitalists, you only do a deal, maybe two full Series A's a year. And I will say that I track it because Tube Mogul is a, a shining star in my anti-portfolio. So you, you track both the one that you did and the one that you missed, and that's uh, it's one that I missed. So, okay. So why do a business plan, right? I'm sure you guys are, are wondering this, and. I just have to tell you that I, I, I can't argue heavily for doing one of the traditional voluminous, voluminous, voluminous business plans of 15 to 40 pages and you know all wrapped up in a bow. What we're seeing today is a business plan. When we say we need to see a business plan, it's really a 10 to 15 slide deck. That's what your business plan is. Now you might have five or so slides behind that that are supportive material and our backup information and our more details, but your business plan is really this deck. And it's not that you haven't gone through the complexity, right, of sifting through all of the details. So I don't know if you guys um, have heard the quote, simplicity on the far side of complexity, but it's, I think it's true here. So what you have to do is wade through that whole morass of details and come out on the other side with something that's clear and concise and direct, and that's what a business plan is. If you write a business plan, which I think it's a good exercise, but it's for you. It's not for, you know, VCs aren't going to read it. Um, honestly, if I get one, they're a yellow flag because it, it means <laughs> that, um, you know, I went up to the, partner, to the other partners and I was sort of asking them questions and, and pinging them to make sure we were all on the same page. And they're like, one of them said, that means they're, they're not from around here, kind of. If we get this big, you know, bound business plan, it's just, well, we might take a look at it, but it usually means they're not kind of, people aren't in tune with what we're really looking for. And one of the reasons is, is as soon as they're written, they're obsolete, right? As soon as you've done all the research, you've tied it up in a bow, it's, you know, things have moved. And what we'd rather see is, see is iteration, very, very fast and quick iteration, and, and learning in terms of what, how's the market reacted to what you're talking about. And what we really want is an exec summary and a pitch. And Brett was kind enough tonight to bring an example of his executive summary here, the year that he won. And the business plan competition. They're, they're up here in this box if you want an example. I, I only brought 15 or 20. Um, out of curiosity, um, by a show of hands, how many of you are thinking about entering the business plan competition? 
Okay, right. so a lot of you. And, and the, the rest of you, are, are you just interested in, in starting a business, or why are you here? Yeah, heads nodding. Okay. For, for us, um, everything Rebecca said rang true. Uh, no one has ever asked me to see the business plan, uh, or our, the business plan that we wrote. And if they ask, that might be a yellow flag to me that they're not concerned about, about the right things and, and they may not be, be from around here. Um, <laughs> that was a quote. <laughs> I, uh, for myself, when, when we started, we, we just had an idea and the business plan, it was a great tool to get myself and, and my co-founder in alignment on what our goals were, what kind of company we wanted to build, uh, our strategy and tactics. And uh, I think going through that, it's kind of like um, pre-marriage counseling. Um, you learn a lot about one another and, and a lot of pitfalls in, in your commitment. So it was great just to get alignment with the team. And then it was really great when people, when we started hiring new people, we just give them the business plan uh, and we'd say, here, this was uh, our point of view um, a year ago, two years ago, you should read this. And we still have people, people read it. So it's really useful to people to see how the business has evolved. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, so what we're not saying is don't write one, but know who the audience is. And the audience is really you. And what you should be able to do is su summarize all of that into what we call a business plan today, which is really a slide deck. So we're going to go through what should be in the slide deck and, and at a more granular level, what can be in your business plan, right? So what does your company do? I mean, give it to us in one sentence on one slide, and I'm not joking, right? If you have to walk somebody through five slides and you're giving them the prelude and you're kind of working them up, you're going to lose them on slide two because VCs have, a, have ADD, and they all have it. And so um, you're going to lose people, and they're, they're going to tune out. And so you know, a couple of examples are Lending Club disintermediates banks by connecting borrowers directly to lenders. Tell me that on the first slide, right? And then we'll, we'll get into the rest of it. But you, let me know what you do so I can get my head around it. Or Practice Fusion is the largest cloud-based electronic medical record, and it's free all that has to be on the slide, but just really focus me on what it is we're talking about. And this always kills me. Lead with the good stuff, right? So if you happen to have a really compelling data point, like you have revenue, um, which is always great, at, or if you have, you know, if you signed a really interesting customer deal or some exciting piece, a tidbit, kind of throw it out there in the first couple of sentences. Um, and, and just, you want to grab the attention and focus people on that very first slide. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, when you do this, I know as an entrepreneur, it's so hard to raise money that you want to really um, sex this up and differentiate yourself. Um, but don't do that so much that people don't get what, what you do. Because if they don't get what you do, you just lose them uh, the rest of the presentation. And then if you can um, titillate them in the beginning, um, and by the way, uh, we're getting real traction. We have five customers. We have revenue. I'll tell you more about that later. You draw them in. It's just like storytelling. Uh, and that's what you're doing. And, and they're investing in, in you and your ability to sell just as much as your idea. Absolutely. You're telling a story the whole time. So the next thing we want to know is what problem are you solving? Now, be careful here. What, what this isn't is like a five-slide kind of synopsis of the history and the background and and all of these things, but you know, hit it and hit it in a slide or maybe two slides. What problem, what consumer pain are you solving? You know, how big is it? Is this something that's you know, small or is this something that people are really doing a lot to work around the situation today? And if so, then how much better is your solution? My favorite example here is in mobile payments. So I spent four years at Nextcard back in the day, which is the first online credit card company. When I was there, we probably saw every rendition of a mobile payment at the time that you could see. And the biggest joke was when my, um, the CMO would tell at the time, and he would say, OK, you get out your credit card, and I'll get out my cell phone, and we'll see who's faster. And so the point of that is, from a consumer perspective, is it really easier to get out your cell phone versus your credit card? No, it, it's the same. The pe consumers don't care. Who cares about mobile payments are the merchants who are paying interchange and getting hit with fees. But, that's really what you want to think about. You know, how big is the pain and what are people doing today to get around it? Or you know, what kind of pain is it causing them? 
And it's a good time to get their buy-in that they believe in the problem that you're talking about too. Um, so if they don't really buy that this is a real problem, then again, the rest of the pitch, you, you kind of lose them. So you, th you say things like, I think we all agree that blah, blah, blah. You talk about the problem and you look for the verbal cues. And, and if they're not buying into the problem, you, you got to iterate because uh, you only get an hour typically in, in these pitches. And really, you just get five minutes and they're either hooked or, or they're not. So. Well, and, and the thing here, if they get it, move on, right? Yeah. So if they get it and they're saying, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And here is another example and they're with you, move on. Leave it alone, go to the next thing. If they don't get it, step, take a step back because sometimes what you're going to have is a clean tech investor in an IT pitch or a life science investor in an IT, IT pitch or vice versa. So you've got to figure out here where your audience is and check if you can before you hit the firm to see who's going to be there and where you've got to start and then read your audience as you go. But if, you, if they get the point, don't belabor it because they'll get impatient. <laughs> right? That's not that kind of show. <laughs> like I said, you gotta titillate them in the beginning. <laughs> oh God! Not that that would titillate anybody. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what's your solution? So, you know, these days things move pretty quick. It's really cheap to get something out there. So, build it. Show me a demo. Even when I was at P&G back in the day, Procter & Gamble, we would actually do some little dummy mocked up demo to show people that they could see and touch and feel. And that's really what you want to do here. And does it solve the problem? Does it address the consumer pain or does it cause another one? Really you know, pay attention to that because that does happen sometimes. Make sure there's a product market fit, that your solution isn't what I call engineers gone wild where there's a, and you see that a lot, right? I mean that affectionately, I'm an engineer in my old life. so. Engineers gone wild is when um, there's a problem and they've kind of engineered every possible thing and consumers can come in and they can choose from a smorgasbord of a hundred different options, right? Well, the truth is, is consumers don't really want that choice. They want freedom from choice a lot of times. They want good choices. They want to be able to do it quickly. And so make sure you pay attention to who your consumer really is and, and what they want. And then what are, if you have a product, tell me what consumers are saying about it and what maybe the data shows and what their testimonials are. I, I think this is huge. And, and if you think about it, your, your scarce resources, which is time and money when, you, when you're starting a business, you definitely want to err on the side of just, just going. You, you, know, you, you want to go build and iterate, especially most of us that are starting internet and software companies where it's pretty easy to get out there with a prototype. Um, just not many companies get funded on, on business plans anymore. And when we would do this, we would go in and demo. I might save the demo for the end. Um, but I would log in to like Barack Obama's account or Bono's account and, and really you know, draw them in and make it real and maybe give them examples that, that they can relate to, but also make it fast. I mean, what they want to see is that, that it's real. Absolutely. So, okay, you've got a great idea, you've got the product, how big is the market? And I want to stress here, there are a lot of great ideas out there, a lot. And a lot of them can be very good lifestyle businesses, which is not a pejorative, right? If you can make a good, a good living and a good sum of money on a great idea and not have to get venture capital, that's a really, that's a, that's a good thing, right? But often, and often the market that you're approaching or that you're after is just too small for venture. So try to assess this on the front end to really know what it is your company needs in terms of capitalization. Do a top down, do a bottoms up, you know, then profile your target customer. Really understand who it is you're going after here and how much will they pay for the product. Go and get some initial market assessment. Talk to your customers and, and find out, you know, based upon the pain point and the alternatives, what will they pay you? And, uh, and, and test that a little bit in, in any way that you can. And then the other thing too here is, are you going to be able to share in the upside? So as your, as your uh, business takes off, do you get a piece of that? And do you get you know, a, a commensurate piece of that as, as it goes? And those are all things to think about. And that's exactly what, what we're thinking about when we're listening to, um, to your pitch and to your idea. And when we're assessing, well, how big can this be? Because that's one of the main questions that we're asking ourselves once we pass the, uh, the interest point.
We learned a couple lessons here the hard way. And when we started, Tumogo was a video analytics company. And, and traditionally, analytics companies, they're, they're just not big markets. So um, we just did not have that much luck fundraising. Um, over the years, we evolved into a video advertising company. And there's this big trend where TV advertisers are taking that money, which is a $70 billion market, and they're spending it online. So that's a big market. And the last time we raised money, we got four term sheets. Uh, first time, we didn't. Um, second thing I learned on this is that certain VCs are looking and reviewing and looking to make an investment in, in markets. And you can save yourself a lot of time if you figure out what, what their thesis is, what they're investing in before you go in. And often, I, I mean, with video advertising, there were VCs, they were blogging about wanting to make uh, a bet in the, in the video advertising space. And, and VCs often follow one another. So once there's uh, you know, Sequoia or Kleiner, one of the big ones, they're making a bet, the other ones follow on. And, and so you need to realize that. And, and you can often, when you're pitching them, use their words and their ideas. But if they don't have a thesis in that space and they don't know anything about it, they may still be interested, but it's going to take a lot longer for them to figure out if it's a real opportunity or not. I think that's, that's exactly right. So this is something that's, that's very important. And this is a key question we ask ourselves all the time. Why now? OK, great idea, but right, why now? So being too early doesn't get you anything. I mean, it, being prophetic um, isn't different than just being wrong right, about the market or the timing. Or, or the company, or the opportunity. And so really let us know why now, why, what market forces are happening now that weren't happening 10 years ago? Because the first thing your partnership's going to tell me is, oh yeah, I've seen 10 of those, and they're dead bodies all over the road, right? It's like if you're in this for long enough. So you really need to be able to answer the question and give them the ammo of why is it now? So a great example of this in our partnership is Practice Fusion, right? It's an electronic medical record. People have tried this many times in the past. Why now? And the, the reason is, is the cloud infrastructure is there to support it. Um, security concerns and privacy issues have been covered. And by the way, the government's paying doctors $44,000 starting next year just for adopting an EMR no matter what it costs. So doctors are going to have this incentive program in place to do this. And so really look at what's changing. What are the key external um, factors that, that are making the market different. Another example is TaskRabbit. I don't know how many of you guys were back, you know, or doing work back in the day, but TaskRabbit is my lackey in you know, year 2000. Same business model, same kind of idea, but the environment and the social ecosystem weren't there 10 years ago to make this business work. Now they are. And so really understand that, especially if there are people who have come before you that haven't been successful. I agree. Okay. Uh, competition, the main point here is what's the competitive landscape. No one really misses this slide. Um, one just kind of funny thing, just remember you're always in the upper right hand quadrant. We've had people get this wrong before. And being from Haas, I want you all to look really good when you go out. So upper right hand quadrant of the, uh, of the slide. And if you tell us there are no competitors, that's a big issue because either you've missed them or it's just not that interesting of a space to be in. And uh, why is it that you're going to win with the competition in the market? I find a lot of entrepreneurs, they, they approach this as, as a slide you have to have. And, and they just they put some logos of competitors in there. And, it, and I think this is one where you can really show um, the people that you're trying to fundraise from how smart you are. On the, on the industry dynamics. And, and the best entrepreneurs, they know exactly what their competitors are up to and why their competitors are creating opportunities for them. And this is where you can start to educate the investor, too. Um, and they're always looking at other deals. And, and they're looking for intel. So you can share with them things. You don't want to sound preachy. Uh, but this is a great slide to, to really you know, show your knowledge of the space. So the business model, and this is, a, this is a really important slide. So you know, I know you all are saying, oh, well, Twitter and Facebook, they didn't have business models. Well, OK, unless your company is Twitter or Facebook, 
and <laughs> you know you need to worry about this. And so if you are Twitter or Facebook, come talk to me. We have a lot of money to invest, so um, would love to talk to you. But you know, spend time here on your business model. Really think about it, because even if it changes, you know, when you first you know launch your product, the fact that you've spent time and you've thought about this and you can talk about it really teaches the investor. Um, you know, how you approach the problem and how you're thinking about the business and talk about how you're going to acquire customers, what's the acquisition cost, what's your pricing strategy, what's your average lifetime customer value. You probably don't have any idea, but if you didn't think it was worth anything, you probably wouldn't do the business, right? So, so make, a, make a guess and build just some assumptions into that you know, just kind of around what, you know, where you're going. So you, you, have, it, you have it in your own head. And then what's your revenue model? And the important thing here is that for something to be venture investable, you have to have, you have to paint a picture of how you get big. So if all of the stars line up perfectly, how do you become the next Google or Facebook? Now, you know, it's not that that's the only plan people are going to invest behind, but there has to be a belief that that could potentially happen for people to, uh, to ve put venture capital money behind you. So help create that picture. And, and don't be over the top. Say, this is our business model. And oh, by the way, you know, if the stars align and all these things happen, then this is where we could go. OK? I think this one's hard. Because at least for us, I mean, you read through our business plan, you'll, you'll laugh at how we thought we were going to make money. It has nothing to do with how we make money now. So I, I think if you're not sure, it's a good slide to show self-awareness, uh, says your financial model, where you can say things like, based on this and this, here's how, what we're thinking. But I think a lot of investors, if they're bought in on the problem you solve and you uh, and the market, that they think they can help you solve this. This is what they do. Um, and you can even, by the way, uh, part of selling is you know we're looking for an investor that can help us with this because we're really strong here and here's how we're going to make it big. Um, I, I think a lot of companies get funded without kind of nailing their their business model, um, which may or may not be be good advice. But I think that's what's happening right now. Um, so. no, I think I think Brett's advice is exactly right. So I think the message is think through it, but also be open about what you don't know. And, and create some options, right? Well, here's three ways we could make money. Here's what we're going, you know, that you've, you want to see you've thought about it. Ideally, you have revenue. <laughs> Ideally. You know, the, uh, uh, you know, even if you go out, like we were actually able to get customers to pay us for a product that was free. And, and what we did is, is they really relied on this product. And we said, look, if you pay us, we will meet with you once a month and we'll uh, prioritize your feature requests um, so that we build the product that you want to build. And so I think do whatever you can early on uh, to bring in revenue and, and iterate and try different things. But, but it shows that you're going to be good at, at finding the money. And I heard someone use this analogy that an entrepreneur is like a heat-seeking missile where you're just gonna, you're gonna find the money. Wherever the money goes, you're gonna go. So here, you may not have nailed it, but if you have some type of revenue, uh, and you went out and made something happen that's hard, I, I think that shows uh, a lot of qualities that, that investors look for. Absolutely. So the, uh, the team slide. So always talk about who's on your team. A company is not one person or just the founding team. A company, or the founding two people, a company is a team. And so include the background of the founders, talk about why they're relevant, and importantly, talk about who else you're going to need on the team and when, and not necessarily a timeline, but you know, when you reach a certain scale or you know, some idea of you know, when you're going to need to uh, scale up and who you're going to need to hire. And then include the advisors and the other board members and their relevant experience. So you know, literally, it's pretty simple. It's a few bullet points, but make sure everything ties into you know, how this is relevant. And sort of a, an aside note, one thing you don't want to do here on the investor piece or the advisor piece is include an advisor who is also a vent, an investor, either an angel or a VC who has not put money into your company. Because the first thing VCs do is go, oh, I know that person. And, and they do invest in companies. 
and they haven't put money in here and they know you better than I do. So what's, it's, it's a red flag. So be careful there. I think this is, this is where you win. This is where you get funded. I mean, there, there's people that get funded um, without a business plan, without an idea, just because of who they are. And, and what you're saying and how you communicate this slide and every other slide is you're, you're funding me because of me, because I'm going to jump through brick walls. I'm going to figure out the model because I'm special. I'm the secret sauce. Um, and, and you don't say that but you say it through, through your confidence uh, and, and your nonverbal behavior. Uh, and this is, so this is huge. And then advisors and board members, I think one thing young startups can do that really uh, gives you an edge and shows a lot of awareness is go recruit independent board members before you have to. A lot of startups, they don't create a board of directors until someone finances them. Um, what we did, we got experts in the space. We got a guy named Dick Costola. He's CEO of Twitter now. And we got a guy named Dave Tock. He co-founded Net Ratings and took it public and sold it to Nielsen. And we convinced these guys to be part of the company. And so by the time I was ra raising venture capital, we had already been having board meetings. Uh, I had real executives that the VCs could call and say, what's the real deal on, on Brett and John? And if you do that in advance, uh, I think you have a huge leg up at the, at the time that you're actually raising money. And, and use this slide strategically. If this is your strong suit, put it first or put it in the first couple of slides. You know, use it where you think it makes the most sense. If you guys are amazing product guys, maybe put it after the product slide and say, this is what we've done. This is what we know how to do. But use it strategically. Yeah, we, I always put the slide first. I would say, here's what we do the big idea, but first let me tell you about, about me and my co-founder and our team. The financial model, I mean, early stage companies, it's, it is kind of like looking into a crystal ball, right? And if you're early, you know, what we really care about is what the, what's the cash burn going to be? So if we write the check, we put money into this early company, the revenue is uncertain, you know, we want to know how long it's going to last you. So how long of a runway do you have to figure out what, you know, that model? And, you know, how many people you're thinking about hiring? Because that's really the biggest factor driving that, uh, that burn rate. And, and how realistic are you about who you're going to hire and how fast you're going to hire? So, you know, all these other things that are on here are, you know, are, should you have to do. Um, but just know that what we're going to zero in on is your burn rate and your head count if you're early stage. Yeah, that, that's where we always got the questions. Now, I think the other thing going on is the uh, expense part of your P&L. That's what you can actually control. You can't really control the revenue, but you can control what you spend. Another great place to show self-awareness um, that you're not you know, unrealistic about how to actually build a business and you can speak to, to the levers. Uh, I may be wrong about our revenue, but I know for every three widgets we sell, we're going to do this um, and educate them uh, on the levers. And then another thing I found is there were some investors that would really dig in on this, and they right away they dig in deep, and I, I found that they were ultimately um, not good fits for us because they just didn't understand how internet and, and software companies grow these days. So use that as a, a danger sign if people are digging into your financial model uh, first meeting. And if they're, if they're pushing on the wrong thing to look, be very wary. And if you put a financial model out there, be sure the numbers foot and there aren't just simple issues because that will cause everyone to dive in very deep and, and be very distracted. So mm -hmm. when you put one out, make sure everything foots. So Final slide, a uh, tip from a prior B-Plan co-chair and B-Plan winner. So tip number one is do a demo. Do it, use the pitch lab to really refine your pitch. You did that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, have a product. Don't just do a demo. Go, go build something and show that you can get traction uh, on no resources. Uh, you know, show them that you're going to be good stewards of, of their money. And put your present, best presenter up. You know, don't play musical, musical presenters. You know, lead with your strongest presenter. You have a short amount of time to sell what you're doing. 
and having you know three to five people present is, is somewhat distracting. You know, a couple maybe is okay, but lead with your best. Shorter is better. So I think what we all know, and I learned this again last week, writing essays to get my kid into kindergarten, believe it or not. Um, but you know, writing a short, concise essay or you know a short, concise presentation is much harder than just you know any verbose link that you like. So tighten it up, keep it short and punchy. If people want to find out more, they're not shy. They'll they'll ask you. And uh, again, do a demo and if, or a product. And if you forget all of this, do a demo when you present your pitch for the BPL competition. Anything to add to that? Sell yourself and everything else follows. Um, even if uh, they're not interested in that particular idea, if they think you're someone that has potential, they'll make all kinds of great connections and, and they'll want to stay close. So everything's about how you portray yourself. Uh, and everything else uh, kind of rolls from there. Good, and I don't think we have a close, this is it, so I don't think we have a close, oh, there we go, I'll turn it up to the first one, but, so do you all have any questions? We can open the floor for questions. We have a mic, and we ask that you all definitely use it. And Kirsten, where is that at? Do you have the mic? Oh, there we go. So there's a mic there, and she has the other one. So. Um, if you guys would just step to the mics if you have questions, and then just, and then uh, we'll go from there. So yes, can you step to the mic, please? Yeah, I can just yell, actually. Actually, could you step to the mic, please? Thank you. Hey, Rebecca. Uh, Hi. So I had a question on. <clears throat> I'm sure you get a ton of inbound volume from people who are interested in selling you their ideas. And I'm curious as to what things you found affected or if effective or if you were an entrepreneur, how would you think if you're out there trying to make cold calls or send emails, which I don't think are very effective, but what are, what are ways that you would uh, advise us in trying to get in touch with the right people when we're MBA students and maybe don't have those relationships? Yeah, great question. So I cannot think, and I've asked this question a lot of the people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have, but I cannot think of a plan that got funded on a cold call. It, it just, I, I don't think it happens, to be honest. But that's not to be disheartening. What that says is that when we do look at things is when somebody that we know has referred it to us and said, hey, you should take a look at this. And actually, being here is an amazing resource because there are so many venture capitalists and investors and advisors and prior CEOs. I mean, Brett, I mean, Brett, you can email Brett first and Brett can send them to me. Um, but, uh, sorry, Brett. Happy to. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so figure out, you know, the connection points, figure out, you know, people that can help you and that can get you that warm introduction. Because you're right, there is a lot that comes in, and that's, that's a key way that we sift. If someone that we know and we, we trust, and we trust their opinion, thinks highly of you and your plan, then we will absolutely take the time to open that up, take a look at it, and give you some feedback. So or that's the key thing. Even better, have them come to you. Um, people always want what they can't have. Do the Berkeley Business Plan competition. There'll be VCs in the audience. Uh, blog, build something that TechCrunch starts to write about. Um, go to the different conferences. Uh, it, our last round of financing, we, we didn't uh, kind of go out and try to raise money. Uh, investors came to us because we were, we were doing good things and, and solving problems. So. But that, that was a later stage deal though, right? So it, there was definitely, there was, there were different stages in yeah, terms of how it happens. Think of Foursquare. Uh, it, yeah, but yeah, I mean, if you're four square, then yeah. If you yes. can get traction, so, do it. Yeah, if you get, can get traction first, investors will find you. But uh, if not, then look for a warm introduction. Hi, um, so the email I got said how to write a business plan, not how to get funding from venture capitalists. Um, and I get a little bit frustrated mm -hmm. sometimes with Berkeley because that seems to be the only form of entrepreneurship that is talked about, like as if, if you're not venture capitalist, you know, then you don't count. 
there are a lot of us doing brick and mortar businesses, small right. businesses, lifestyle businesses, lots of things. Can you address that issue? Uh, in terms of, so it was how to write a business plan. So if you are, uh, and I've done, a, I've done a brick and mortar business actually in the past, so in, or a lifestyle business. So in that case, you know, I think what you, what you need to do is put your thoughts together and a lot, it depends how you do that best, right? So if you do that best by you know, writing things down and, and putting a formal business plan together, that, that's great. And you can get a lot of feedback on it. So if you want somebody to look at it and give you feedback, I think putting a pitch deck together helps you a lot. But you've got to, you know, the, the, the end is not the business plan. The end is the business. And the business plan is the means to an end, right? But it, and again, it's, it's what helps you. Right? And so if this helps you to go through the process, and if it helps you to get feedback, then, then you should consider doing that. <laughs> other that is, get funding than right. right. Well, and that was part of the deck, or part of the presentation, right? It's, if it's not a venture plan, and not everything is. So in terms of the other audiences, I mean, even if you go to SCORE, the, there's, there's materials on how to write a B plan. And part of the reason I didn't go through sort of step by step is I Googled it last night and there's, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of resources on how to do this. So I think what you have to do is just know your audience, know what the purpose is, and tailor it to that. Yeah, forgive the bias. You, you have a venture capitalist and a yeah. venture capital funded company. My, my last company, it was an e-commerce company, and we sold gadgets and consumer electronics and stuff you don't need. And, and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't VC fundable. Mm -hmm. um, we we still wrote a business plan. It was to a different audience. Um, you know, we wrote it to to angels, and I cashed out my four hundred one k. So so you're right. Venture capital is not not for everybody. Uh, when you take it, then you have huge expectations and board meetings every four weeks, and um, you know it, it can add a lot of stress if you're not convinced that that's what you want in your life. But I'll save you a copy of, of the one I wrote so you can see it. And if you come up afterwards, you just grab it. So. Hello, you guys. Thank you for sharing your, your experience with us. Um, I am a member of a company who's doing research. Well, our company is named, so um, the name is Solfice Research, and we are engineers and biologists. So I was wondering how you guys would write a, you know, a business plan for catered to a biology or you know, engineering product. As you were saying, you, know, you guys have um, advertisements and things like that. What well, we offer are solutions for real-world problems. For example, train <laughs> money. No, no. What a, like, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I, like that, you I know. think you start that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was referring to you know, it's we are we are working with um, train monitoring and you know, uh, uh, traffic monitoring and things like that. So I was wondering how you would cater that to attract venture capitalists. I'll let Rebecca answer because Morgan Thaler. They're top one or two in the world in, in your space, uh, not in, in what I do. So. Hmm. Yeah, so I think with life sciences, right, then? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So life sciences is a little different, and uh, it's more focused on intellectual property and ownership. So that's an area that I would spend more time on. And you know, I think the key elements of the plan are still there. I think the main difference is that the IP is very important in life science, where in, in software and IT, we kind of believe that things move so fast that you know, by the time you've gotten your patent, you know, the whole field has moved on. But that's the main piece of it, I believe, that, that is different. And then if you, but you said you are going for venture capital funding, right? We would like to, because um, we're running on hopes you know, and just love for the science, and we do need to pay our bills, too. Yeah, so, and so. we'd like to grow the, it too. The year before me, a company called Aurora Biofuels won the business plan competition. And they followed all the same ingredients. They, they wrote a plan. Um, they won the competition. They, they solved a problem. They explained it. They solved a real problem. Uh, <laughs> and I think they got $10 million in funding you know, within yeah. six months of, of graduating, which is really hard to do. So formula doesn't change that much. And I think, it, like Brett said, with advisors, that's, that's going to be really important as well. So advisors, clients, you know, maybe some more senior people in the space would be, is more important on that end of the spectrum. Cool. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.
Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> in your slides, you wrote about size the market, top down and bottom up. And I, I just want a little clarification on that. And uh, are you sharing in the upside? What does that mean? And finally, do you have any suggestions if we are seeking fund from overseas investor? Is there any something we should be aware of? Do you want me to take that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so top down or bottom up, that's hopefully something that you're, you're, you do here at Haas. So top down means you say, okay, how big is the total overall market and how, you know, can we get a piece of that and what piece do we think we can get? Bottoms up is just building, you know, bit by bit by bit. Okay, we're getting this, you know, this many clients, you know, Q1, this many Q2, and it's, it's building to make sure that you're converging in a, in a similar number. At bottom up is the way to do it. Top down is if we only sell to 1% of all the people in China, a some outrageous assumption like that. Bottom up, you're using kind of reasonable levers to try to estimate what, what you can do. Yeah, but top down's a sanity check. Yeah. Because you'll be amazed what yeah. people can build. And then, That's true. And you're, you're like, wow, so you're gonna make a, a billion dollars and the market currently is 100 million. I mean, that's, that's where the top, mm -hmm. the top down is a sanity check, right? And, and then your other question, Inve foreign in investors like, what? Sharing in the upside. Sharing the upside means if I just charge you $5 a month, no matter what kind of volume, and then I make you wildly successful and I still just get $5 a month, okay. that doesn't work so well. So you want to be sure that if you make somebody wildly successful with your platform, your technology, or your product, that you, um, you share it in a piece of that. And then foreign investment, I, I can't really help you there. If you're looking specifically for foreign investors, I, that's not something that I... I'm very familiar with. Well, <clears throat> somebody suggested, like from Europe, there might be Europe and Turkey, there might be some in investors interested in investing in the U.S. Is it possible to go and get those? And what, you know, as a, if there is a business here, what they should be aware of? I, I think when you start raising money, you see how incredibly difficult it is. A, and the rule of thumb I have is take it where you can get it when you can get it. Uh, and take as much as you possibly can, because um, it's hard to do, whether it's foreign or, or abroad. I mean, if you got your choice of investors, which we should all be so lucky to, to do, you're going to want people uh, that can influence the markets that, that you're in, and they're probably going to be local, not, not foreign. Thank you. Two questions. Uh, I was surprised to see, actually, you were not talking about you know, how much money I, I'm, I'm looking for. Mm. That's probably true. I think on the last slide, no, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want to include that. So on okay. in the last slide, um, you'll usually put how much money you've gotten, you've raised to date, and then how much money you're, you're looking for. And, and you can talk about that verbally as well. So it depends on you know, what you need and what stage you're at. I, I learned another lesson here. Um, and, and that's a, a lot of VCs, when they do the first round, that they're doing... VC math, and they're kind of backing in to the valuation of your company based upon what you want to raise. And, and so kind of a rule of thumb is, well, after the first round, the owners should probably still own 50% of the company. So if you say, uh, I'm going to raise $3 million, they're going to give you a $3 million valuation. Not always, but three plus three is six, then they own half your company. So I think generally, if you can, um, you're going to be diluted the same no matter what, so you should raise as much money as you can. Second question is uh, the timing of uh, actually pitching the business plan. So I'm wondering, for instance, if I do not have everything, okay, you're talking about the revenue, customers, etc., which I may not have, but I, I need money. So <laughs> how, you know... When when do you think actually you know when is a good time actually to to do so this? I, you'll hear this a lot from entrepreneurs. Like I I can't raise money until I have a product, but I can't build a product until I raise money. And those chicken and egg problems. I mean, solving those is the definition of entrepreneurism. Um, so it, you know you need to be able to do that before you raise money. Um, because no one wants to invest in someone that it, it's unclear if they can do that or not. And the best way to do it is go sell something before you build it. it you know, sell, sell ahead of, of your product cycle. I see. 
Thank or, you. or sell something. I was starting a company and I was doing a deal where I had a, a large company that was essentially going to fund the development efforts and they had the rights to use the product. And then I would have licensing rights to take that product and do other things with it. And maybe they wanted me not to work with you know, competitor XYZ for a year, but I was open to the rest of the market. So that, there are scrappy ways to do this. And I think you, just, you have to show that kind of resilience to, uh, to get people to, to put money into the company. But there are, there are ways. Thanks. Hi, just a um, quick question in terms of ideas which you pitch and the quality of ideas is um, how original does the idea have to be? Uh, because for example, you know, you could have a completely brand new orig original idea where people haven't tried this, people haven't done this, you know, you come in there and you, you pitch it and it's, you know, sort of scenario A. Another scenario is that there's 10 companies and they all do different things and you kind of take a little bit from each company, mix it in, so you're actually using sort of existing technologies but put a new spin on it and that's what you sell. And which, which sort of idea is better funded or you know, sounds more attractive to a VC? The one that makes money? So it doesn't, it doesn't matter? I think that's a, I, I, I'll answer it now, I'm sure you have. I, I, uh, I don't think that there are a lot of new ideas out there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in a given week, and it's funny how this happens, you, won't have, you will not have heard about a space and then all of a sudden you'll have three companies that come in that week that all are talking about that space, uh -huh. right? And uh, you know, it's all about execution. It is all about execution. And I don't think you can look at a single big company out there and honestly say they were the first ones to try it. But they executed much, much better than the ones that came before them. I agree. It, it, I think you don't want to make up problems or markets that don't exist or people don't believe in. But new ideas and existing big markets are, are great, even though they are rare. Okay. Yeah, cool. definitely. Thanks. Um, so my question is purely in the context of the B plan competition. Um, for the competition, um, how much weightage, if you guys know, is given to the perfectness or the structure, etc., of the business plan versus the actual idea itself. You need to look competent, I think, in the business plan, and you need to sell. Because as a CEO, your job is to sell, whether it's to sell people, to recruit them to come to your company, so you have to convince people to work for you, whether it's convincing clients to work with you or investors in the next round, you've got to be able to sell. So I don't care that every I is dotted and T is crossed and you put everything in the plan and it goes a certain way, um, but I do care that you know, I'm compelled by you and, and the idea that you're presenting. And what I care the most about is what your, con what your customers are saying, right? So you know, product development 101 at Procter & Gamble is what, what, I, you know, what I kind of think doesn't matter to some extent, but the, what the customer says is, is the right thing. So if you've got traction, I'll listen, right? And, and it doesn't matter if you've forgotten a, a slide here or there or maybe not been the most eloquent in how you presented. I, I think look at the, if, if you want to win the competition, yeah. look at the business plan as, as just that's the threshold. Kind of like getting into Cal, you have to have, you know, <clears throat> a certain SAT or ACT or, or GMAT score to get into Haas. Um, that doesn't get you in that gets you uh, kind of considered. And it's going to be your pitch. It's going to be your executive summary that gets you to the semifinals. Is this a good idea? Do I get it? Is it a big market? Is it fundable? Remember, VCs are, are the judges, or at least they were when I did it. And then everything from there is, is the pitch. Um, your slides and your presentation. Um, let me put it in a slightly different way. So for the B plan, and again, purely in the context of the B plan competition, yes. do you need a working demo and things like that, or is that even a demo phase? Or it's a pure, it can be a pure idea? It, yeah, as long it, as you can sell it? It can be an idea, of course. Um, you don't need to do a demo. There, there's no rules. Okay. Um, but I, how many teams do we think will compete this year? Like, like 100 or something like that? Yeah, the chairs are... <laughs> So that, that's a lot. Um, so you're going to want something that makes you stand out and, and makes you, you real incredible. So you don't need a running product or existing. I mean, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's no like requirements for that, right? But like Brett said, 
Um, you're going to be up against life sciences companies that probably have you know, some working kind of prototypes that they've tested. You're going to be against people who are, at least have a proof of concept. So I think, um, I think you can win with an idea, but I, if you want to, you always want to put it in the best possible light, right? And, and think about who the competition is. So right. the more proof points you can show, the better your chances. Do you guys know the actual stages, like how, how the competition works? Because you, you start by submitting an executive summary, and then after that, you submit a full business plan. And is it only some people are invited to submit a business plan? Is that how it works? Yeah. Yes. Um, and of the people that submit business plans, only a portion of them are going to be invited to the semifinal round. And in the semifinal round, you're actually going to do like a 15 minute pitch. Is that right? 30? Less. Less. You're going to do a short pitch to a panel of judges, many of whom will be actual venture capitalists. And then if you make it through that round, there's a final round where you do the same thing uh, in front of VCs, and then you do it again in front of uh, your peers and the community uh, at the auditorium down below. And you have the opportunity to not only, there's two awards. There's an award that the judges give out, and then there's going to be an award that the people give out um, based upon the best presentation. So those are, those are the steps. And you win both, right? Yeah, we won both. Won both. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that happens. That happens. So, so think of the exec summary as your ticket into the competition. So do the one pager, refine it, sell it. That is your ticket into the competition. Because if you don't make it past the exec summary, summary on, there is no writing a full B plan, right? So think of that as your ticket in, and uh, and, and structure it accordingly. Afterwards, if you have any more, you can also go to bplan.berkeley.edu for more information. So it's bplan.berkeley.edu for the actual rules. And, and I think as I said, the rules are pretty minimal, but these are guidelines for how to win. So yeah. this is how you put your best foot forward. But the rules, and if you have something else you want to put forward, that's fine as well. But if you want to do best and give you the best shot to win, this is what they're, they're telling you. So again, if you have any questions, you can talk to either me or, or Brandon afterwards. So. Thank you. Well said. Hi. I have two related questions. The first one, we're working on a consumer lending business model, and that requires hundreds of millions of dollars in capital, potentially going to the billions of dollars. Would you recommend venture capitalists as an avenue? Um, and the second question is, how do you find out which VCs or entities really focus on consumer lending or financial services at large? So, uh, so I definitely focus, focus on financial services. I was at NextCard and lending, and I am investor in Lending Club. You asked if you need venture capital. Uh, yes, if you're if you're doing consumer lending, absolutely. Because I just there are certain businesses that, in order to scale, you, you have to do it. And there's a ton of uh, regulatory hoops and things like that you're going to have to jump through, and the legal bills will be substantial, right? So that that's a business that probably does require venture capital money. You can figure out a way to do it without it. That's great, but you know that's definitely a candidate for venture capital if it's compelling. And then to figure out who does that, think about who the um, who you know. You, it's really it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you do a bunch of Google searches. Usually, companies have a, a page about who their invest who their board members are, and and what venture capital firms they're with. And then you can look and go to their sites and see you know what else they've done. So, um, so that's always a good way to do it. And, and usually, you can just Google financial services investors. And it's just kind of following a trail. And you can ask the venture capitalists. You know, if they're not interested, well, who else is in financial services and, and looking at deals like this? But um, investors try to make themselves easy to find. They, they don't try to, uh, to hide, definitely. And then you have the whole PayPal mafia, too, right? So <laughs> it's always an option. Any other questions? You can probably take two more. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. I'm, in, uh, I'm in the process of uh, calling some people whom we have some connections with to uh, serve as the board of directors, uh, to serve on the board. Uh, are there some incentives offered to, uh, to the board members uh, to join, or what kind of in incentive are these? Or There, there can be. Um, 
I, I think for most companies, you're going to give board of directors uh, a small bit of equity. And, and you're going to have that equity vest so that they, they earn it over time as, as they help you. And I think rule of thumb is going to be maybe a, a quarter percentage if, if you're really young um, and, and less if, if you're kind of more advanced. But some people do it for free. Some people do it for cash. Some people do it for just to stay you know, close with entrepreneurs. Some people will do it if you just pick up their expenses to board meetings. So. Well, and you want to... Do you want to talk to him about advisors versus board members? Yeah, you know, board members kind of control your destiny. They become your boss. They've got a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders to, to make sure that, that you're doing a good job. Now, at your stage, you are the shareholder, so they, they can't fire you yet. Um, but be careful who you choose as, as your board members because your, your fate's in their hands where an advisor is just someone that you meet up with maybe over, over coffee and they just help you out when they can, but there's no, there's no financial stake um, that they have. Well, you could give them stock as well, but, but they can't, um, um, it, they're not gonna control your destiny. Uh, they can't do they can't things vote. like vote, block when you raise money, et cetera. And you could always make somebody an advisor See how committed they are and transition them into a board member if you think they really add value to the company. Be careful who you put on the board. Thank you. I, I wanted to ask about the team. So um, how, how important is diversity of experience on a team? For example, I'm a PhD student. If I wanted to pitch an idea with three other PhD students, um, will that detract from the fact that other teams also have MBAs and uh, what not like a diverse group of people or is it good enough that we have you know a bunch of experts in uh, the science field and we're gonna hire or I don't know something I, like that. I'm laughing just I think the rule is the, the fewer <laughs> MBAs the better okay. uh, if you're if you're a team of four PhDs you're you're looking good you're looking you're fine yeah, yeah we'll find you the MBA no. yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I think uh, you're fine. I mean, we don't we don't scratch our head and say we need like this whole diverse, you know, skill set or anything like that. Um, that's what you gets you into business school, not what gets you into uh, gets you funded. So, if you, um, yeah, I mean, if you're experts in the space, that's that's great, right? So I think you know you. It detracts a little bit from like how you're gonna manage the company if they're like you've never taken you know, the MBA courses, like how do you know what's going to happen or when you're pitching? Seriously, I'm just laughing. Um, so I think, um, I think everyone needs to be realistic about what their strengths and, and goals are, right? So do you want to manage the company? Yes. For how long? Until it's size. Like if it's a thousand people, can you, can you do that? Maybe. 100 million in revenue? Maybe. Okay. So I think um, I think VCs are always willing to, to, to work with you and give you the shot. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I've had people that come to me and said, "Hey, you know, I've got this. I'm a technology person or a team, and I've got a great idea. I don't want anything to do with this. You know, fundraising, hiring people, dealing with HR, working with attorneys. Like, get somebody else to do that for me." So. But think about the great internet companies. They're all founded by engineers. All of them. That figured the business stuff out along the way. And that, that stuff's fun to figure out. You'll, you'll enjoy it. So. Yeah, yeah. Go back and look at the, uh, the Stanford companies. And uh, there's only like two or three out of GSB. They're all out of the engineering school, pretty much. So it's, uh, go, go back and do the research on that one. There's probably 20 MBAs in the room that would love to help if you need help. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and Timber. So Timber Technologies was a really good success out of Berkeley. And what they did was um, Nick Storiali was a MBA, and he worked with some engineering students. And basically, I think they sold the company. And I, I'm going to get this wrong, okay? But it was impressive. It was like a year, 18 months later, for over $100 million. I mean, it was pretty quick. So. So I think know what you, you're good at, and if, you don't, if you're not good at managing, go team up with an MBA. Right. Are there any MBAs looking for an idea in engineers right now? So 
talk to these people afterwards. Yeah, and I, and I tend to be a little biased. I was an engineer in my old life, so I, I, I and then I came and get, got a business degree. So, um, so I, but I, I mean, it goes it goes both ways. But yeah, you're you don't we're not looking for diversity, right? We're looking for skill sets and people who can who can uh, who can get things done. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, can you share a little bit on how your um, business model actually evolved? Because you mentioned that in the beginning you were targeting more in the analytic um, online space and then afterward you move into advertising space, right? If yeah. you can share a little bit on that. And then the second one is, what is your motivation on becoming an entrepreneur? Is it to make a lot of money and to sell your business after a certain amount, after you had a certain revenue or what is it? Because um, I have a, my husband and I have a brick and mortar business, and we're kind of in the middle right now, where we are like, man, this is taking so much of our life, and where do we want to go from here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah entrepreneurism does that. Um, I, I mean, basically, we started a company that no one wanted to pay for our service. Um, we started a video analytics company. Google Analytics is free. Um, we ended up making our analytics product free, and we used the data to help with the advertising problem that we solved. And we just kept kind of following the money, and, and eventually, um, you know, we landed in this market where there's lots of brand advertisers that are moving online. The motivation question is really interesting. I, I think, I think, all entrepreneurs are most entrepreneurs are money motivated. I, I certainly am, but I think more of it's autonomy and control. Um, you control your destiny. You get to be the boss. Um, I would never be the person they send out to, to fundraise or, or do speeches or really do anything at a big company. Um, and you get to do all that on, on your own. So um, personally, I want to try to build something big. We had an opportunity to sell the company recently. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully that opportunity is still there if we don't do what we think we're going to do. But I want to create something and build something, and it, you know, building something that that you're proud of. I think you know inspires a lot of us to to go take the crazy risks and, and spend the time that you need to spend to make it successful. Uh, thanks for the great presentation, guys. I have a quick question, especially for Rebecca. Uh, so it's clear, you know, you got to have a good business plan to get funding. That's essential. But what if there are some ideas, there are some scenarios where the idea is really, really great, but the business plan is not really that great? From VC standpoint, do you do any due diligence, or how do you handle those scenarios? Yeah, I mean, I would say of the companies there is not a correlation between how fabulous the business plan is in terms of you know, how it looks and all of those things and, and who we fund. Um, I actually did this the other day and I dusted off a couple of independent investments I've made. And uh, they weren't beautiful business plans, right? But I love the team. I like the space. I believe they could do it. And, uh, and it's all about, they had great data, right? And, and the graphs were, uh, Quite compelling. So, I swear, if you have if you have one graph in your presentation, it's consumer traction and it's the hockey stick already. You, you, they don't, people don't even listen to the rest of your plan. I mean, it, it, it's kind of it's that way. So, um, so I think it's it's substance over form, right? And if you've got both, that's great, right? Now, there's also there's there's two things. There's winning the competition, right? And so, winning the competition, I think you you definitely have to have both. Ideally, you would have both in all cases, but we, uh, we see a lot of plans. I mean, I probably see 25 deals come through a week where I talk one-on-one -on -one with the entrepreneur and see some version of their, of their pitch. And uh, the best ones that I really like never get through the deck. It's sort of slide three, and I'm asking questions, and they're moving through the pitch and, and answering those. And we're having a conversation. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how it goes. So I, I think that's another point, is just be very flexible when you're talking to an investor because if they like what you're doing, they're gonna just start asking questions and you need to be able to work people through um, the information in your deck pretty quickly. Okay, thanks. One more question and I think, uh, I think that's good. Okay. 
Actually, I don't have a question. Oh. Um, I have a plug for the rest of the uh, Lesser Center's best practice series. So if there is one more question, please come on up. Otherwise, we've started to see a few people trickle out. So this isn't a hard close necessarily. Um, it depends on our panelists. They might stick around and answer some of your personal questions for a second. We want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Bush. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Global Social Venture Competition, which along with the Berkeley Business Plan Competition is one of the co-sponsors of this best practice speaker series. Um, I want to put a quick plug in for the next uh, installment in this series, which is next Tuesday, December 7th. Um, same time, same place, right here in this room. The focus is uh, on design thinking. So basically that second point in the slide deck, what, uh, how does your idea, your product, or your, your solution really solve that problem? And it's also going to be focused on the bottom of the pyramid. So it's uh, designed for the bottom of the pyramid. By that we mean those four billion people living on roughly two dollars a day or less. Um, this is, um, excuse me, we're going to have some really great speakers. One is uh, Jonathan Cedar, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called BioLite. They make a very uh, high efficient uh, wood burning stove. And David Green, who's an entrepreneur and MacArthur Fellow um, as well. Roxanne Miller, who is a uh, Haas MBA from 2009, will be here as well. So we really hope you all join us. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists tonight. Um, it's been a really fantastic. <laughs>